Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, happy Latinx Heritage Month. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Sarah. I'm a design program manager here at Dropbox, and I'm also a co-lead for Ladies Who Create. Um, for those of you that may not be familiar with Ladies Who Create, um, we're a forum for women and non-binary creatives um, at Dropbox and beyond with the goals of fostering deep relationships through connection and knowledge sharing um, and to help everyone feel like they, they belong. Um, a few months ago, we launched our first publication and editorial series called Feminist Propaganda, which profiles creative women within the Ladies Who Create community um, and discusses things like feminism, creativity, and ambition. If you haven't gotten a copy of the zine yet, don't worry, I will paste a link in the Zoom chat later. Um, we're so excited to have Berenice join us today. Um, Berenice is a designer on the Hello Sign team here at Dropbox and was also one of the featured women in feminist propaganda. Um, she'll be sharing some personal stories today on her background, her career journey, and overcoming obstacles. Um, we will have some time after the talk to answer a few questions. So feel free to submit and upvote any questions that you have in the Zoom Q&A feature as Berenice is um, sharing her presentation. And with that, I'll hand it over to Berenice. Thank you, Sarah. All right, let's do this. Okay. All right, well, hello and welcome. Can everyone see my presentation all right? Sweet. Um, so yeah, my name is Berenice and I'm a designer at Dropbox and the HelloSign team. And let's get a few things out of the way. How does she say her name? Well, my name for uh, those who are non-Spanish speakers, it's uh, a combination of the word better and nieces. And then you drop the R and you drop the S and it's just Berenice. So a little bit of a hard time with a soft R, but hopefully it just kind of goes smoothly after that. It's my little slide that I keep handy for situations like this. Um, so yeah, I am born and raised in Mexico, in Northern Mexico, in a place called Ciudad Juarez, which sits in the border of three states and two countries, New Mexico, Texas, and Chihuahua, which is my home state. It is like a wonderful place to grow up in the sense that it's just kind of out there in the magical Chihuahuan desert. It's, um, you get like the interaction of two cultures and who doesn't love just kind of those magical desert nights. And you know, the, the whole dynamic of living in the border, it's really interesting. Um, our sister city is El Paso, Texas. And although we are in different countries, we are kind of isolated by miles and miles in the, of desert around us. So you have to drive so many hours outside of El Paso to get to anywhere else in Texas. You have to drive miles and hours away from Ciudad Juarez to get anywhere else in the state of Chihuahua. So um, we're kind of sister cities in that way. And then we kind of have each other in the middle of the desert. And there's just a lot of energy between the two cities. We have the same background. Um, we were founded at the, around the same time and we, you know, share a lot of like, you know, great cultural, you know, assets and, and there's a huge com uh, commuting population that goes between the cities every day. Um, and when you grow up, you kind of have the best of, of both worlds, you know, so it means having two, two, of, of two things, right? So you have twice as many the TV channels, so you get the uh, telenovelas, and you also get Mr. Rogers, you know, you get the Saturday morning cartoons, but you also get like, I don't know, like documentaries in Spanish, you get radio stations in English, you get radio stations in Spanish, um, and you get to go shopping, to Target in the mall, and then be back in Juarez riding your bike in your neighborhood in the afternoon. So this kind of duality that you live in, it's just very unique to living in the borderland. And I love it so much. And I'm always happy when I go back. So I can talk about my early influences. So I was always a creative uh, kid. My mom always knew that I was going to be in some sort of like artistic field. Because I was always, you know, putting up plays, I was always drawing, writing stories. My dad wanted me to be a writer so bad. Um, I was playing a lot with my mom's like 
uh, fabric scraps. She would do a lot of my clothes and costumes for school. For a while, she thought I was going to be a fashion designer. But um, but yeah, I, she she always knew that I was going to lean into something um, creative. So let me tell you a little bit of like visually where what is happening like in like around me that kind of shaped a little bit of my influences. And as any, I think as any Mexican growing up in Mexico or in the border um, or places or communities that have like a strong um, Latin heritage, you have a lot of like the Mexican um, traditional sign painting and you cannot escape it and why should you if it's just that like, it tells you pretty much uh it gives you a really good glimpse of like uh, a craft that it's um slowly disappearing but still very predominant in mexico i learned how to read very early on and i kind of suspect that this had to do a lot with this because um then you have like everything around you is like shouting words at you and then you kind of just pick them up really really quickly and also um, the public transport is very common that the that the buses are decked out with like lettering and like some cryptic like quotes and messaging and kind of like um, Germanic kind of lettering and, 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 and it's just just really fascinating to to kind of have that sense of normalcy and then you go somewhere else, for example, like the Bay Area and like not see that very often. Um, another one of my influences is um, the textbooks that we would get as a as part of the public education uh, program in Mexico. We get like free uh, government funded books and um, you get a few anthologies of, of stories and legends and like riddles. And I always thought it was really fascinating that all the styles like in the books were so different. And I later came to realize that um, they weren't redesigning the books every every single year. Sometimes it would give them a little bit of a, a facelift, but a lot of the stories and the graphics that came with them were also were pretty much reprints from the same story and graphic from like the 1960s and 70s. So you get a lot of those legacy graphics in like 1990, in the early 1990s, which is the generation that I got these books originally. Um, but I mean, just look at those like psychedelic um, little animals, like that cool lion and like that super swanky fox. Um, as a little girl who was just, I was just kind of like super immersed into, into how, how do you even come up with that? And like how the mood that it gives to the stories that you're reading is just incredible. And like, you can see in the image on the right, that it's like, that is such a kind of like 1970s, interesting, like wash watercolor and like black strokes around shapes just in the compositions just kind of kind of blend into each other it is so kind of reminiscent of a time and you can probably pick up a few of things that we see now coming back to like illustration from that time so um yeah so i went to high school and i was still kind of like not 100 percent sure what i wanted to do in terms of like college um my parents were always very supportive of me kind of choosing my own path but i'm not gonna lie i think coming from like a blue collar background and and you know uh middle class we don't have a ton of money but we kind of we want to my parents wanted to encourage their kids to kind of like pursue their happiness they were a little wary of like me going into the arts but never really like never really pushed back um but i, I gotta say my third and final influence for what i ended up choosing to do uh career-wise i'm a, i'm not embarrassed but i'm a little i'm a little shy to reveal that uh, i had to do with rave flyers in the early 2000s um ciudad juarez and el paso has they have a, a an amazing electronic music scene it's just huge, tremendous. And what a, you know, there's no better place that to have a rave than in um, the desert, right? So uh, we were actually having a lot of uh, really famous DJs coming into Ciudad Juarez to a particular um, club, I think it's called Hard Pop, um, from all over the world. And um, pretty much people loved it. And the promoters were actually spending a ton of money in hiring agencies local and um and from mexico city to create like the promotional material to really represent these artists so um these are some of the things that i was like looking at and i was like this is so cool you know i was like 16 and just loving it um 
and I said, you know what, I want to do what they're doing. Like, I don't know how they come up with those spiky, cool, um, colorful shapes, but I want to do whatever that is. And like, you know, there's a whole mood to creating like graphics that go into the music industry that at that time I just started connecting um, the importance or like how much it is for like a story to have a graphic that really like just pushed it to the next level. So yeah, I pretty much told my parents that I was going to study graphic design and they were just like, like, all right, this, you know, you kind of just do you, do you. Um, I really, they, they really wanted me to um, just really pay attention to the opportunities at work. They always emphasize like, hey, whatever you do, just do absolutely the best you can because, you know, you kind of like decisions are expensive. And, you know, again, like uh, coming from like a middle class background and my parents had to overcome a lot of obstacles um, in their life to kind of like put their kids through college. Um, they wanted to make sure that I was following something that I really felt passionate about. So I went to college. I went to U University of Texas El Paso. Shout out to UTEP Miners. Um, and yeah, my parents were, uh, I was I'm so proud. My parents uh, started a little business so they could um, help uh, pay my tuition, uh, which was uh, out of state, but through like some programs, I was, we were able to like bring it a little bit um, down so they could afford it. Um, and uh, yeah, pretty much it started. I was super excited. And I would love to know, uh, maybe like here, the, uh, the, the people who are joining us, our guests, did you, um, do you have any creative professional maybe in your life, uh, maybe someone in your family who was uh, an artist or an illustrator or photographer? Uh, we're going to have a poll up and I would love if you could answer just so I get to know um, where you guys are at and see. All right, see results coming in because for me, I mean, there was no one really in my life that was um, like a creative professional that I could get some like of the inside scoop. Um, or really kind of like a little bit of the mentorship of like what a creative journey kind of looks like or could look like. Cool. So it seems like a few people did. That's awesome. Uh, most of the people answered no. So for those who did have, that's, that's amazing, right? Someone you can kind of like uh, connect early on and kind of get you in that sense. And not that my parents didn't get me, but there was always like kind of cryptic for them. Like what, what is she, what is she feeling when she's like really kind of, you know, heads down creating something or like, um, and, and, you know, it's, 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 it's importance of community, right? Like having someone to, to connect with and, and to share the struggle, like kind of how we're doing today, right? Uh, yeah, so I'm getting like mom's art director. That's amazing. Father, musician, photographer, like that's, that's amazing. Um, that keep them close. That's, I, I get, as, as people get older, they get wiser and like, and I'm sure that the, the advice never ceases to be, to be useful, right? Cool. So I studied graphic design, but then I also had to pick um, just a minor or like other classes to take. And I was not, I was not good at printmaking, to be quite honest. Um, I just couldn't keep an edition straight. Like I really was like all my prints were different and I just was not, it was not just doing great. And I was a broke student and I couldn't just afford the paper. So I tried my hand at painting and I loved it. Um, let me see, let me share my Okay, so yeah, I, I went into painting and it just kind of like became like a, a, a love to me. And it really provided the foundations for what later would be in my career as also an illustrator. Um, I painted pretty much on anything I could find. Um, you can see on the first picture, those are some parquet uh, tilings that I found, that my sculptor teacher was getting rid of from the demo. And I went over there and, and picked a few on my, on my friend's car and I put like a little canvas together and I painted on top of it. Um, I painted on like, you know, I repainted other people's thrown away canvases and uh, I kept it like cheap by maybe only using the colors that I had at the time. So, you know, real scrappy, um, you know, kind of trying to, to keep it um, economical, but also really trying to use what I had to like 
and kind of give it, you know, give it like a new life. Uh, so painting on wood would really become kind of like what I did, like a staple of what I did through my painting courses. Um, at the time, this is, let's talk about, I think this is 2008 at this time, and the recession hits. Um, the people who are graduating at the time are having difficulty finding jobs. People, it's, the spirits are not very high. Um, and at the same time, Ciudad Juarez is going through very difficult times. Um, if you uh, haven't heard of the drug war in Juarez, we had um, this huge, long wave of violence the last two years, and it made Ciudad Juarez um, for, a, for a good while, like the most dangerous city in the world. Um, that's the city that I would go back to every day, um, you know, from college, just kind of going back and forth with other hundreds of students who who, who did the same thing as I did. And um, you kind of have to live, you, there's no escape. You have to um, live your sense of normal, so you have to keep it somehow. Um, but a lot of people did leave. Uh, I think around 100,000 people left Ciudad Juarez for other places in Mexico or to the US. Um, this is in the middle of like my graphic design courses and I could tell that the whole curriculum was kind of shifting towards helping students during this critical time to use their skills and the things that they're learning to provide a voice to the situation that they're living. So we all kind of got to make posters and to pour our pretty much our hearts and souls on bringing attention to, to what was going on in the border. Um, there were a lot of like really cool traveling shows that brought the posters around the world and around the US. Um, some of them uh, here from of mine that uh, made it into some art shows. And I think what was important for us too is that um, as, as, as cheery as things can be um, when you're kind of an optimist person, you also have to take the time to reflect on what's not working and having the the as an artist as a, as a creative person having the the i guess the courage of using your voice and your skills to if we need to criticize the government or criticize the current the status quo um we learned a lot from from that time and um yeah i mean i ended up uh i mean things got slowly better not 100 percent, but i mean you kind of survive through that and in the city i think ciudad juarez and el paso are very resilient and and they have continued to 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 get better and their people have have always been you know fighters and and we're still here you know um so i graduated and i was interning at the time at a little boutique agency in el paso uh, called Viva Impulse Creative. Now they're called Hello Amigo. And I was doing a lot of like agency work as an intern first, and then they took me in after graduation and I stayed there for a, for a couple of years. And I did their um, mostly branding and like a little bit of packaging and posters and advertising. Um, very exciting to have a job <laughs> after graduating and doing the recession and um, you know, just kind of like having the opportunity to to actually do this for, for a living. Um, so I was still pretty broke, I'm not gonna lie, but you know, I was just excited, you know, and to be able to, to do this for a living. So yeah, I did the most branding. Um, I, I think that the experience of working in an agency gives you a lot of um, tries to like, opportunities to present to clients for the first time, have that conversation with a creative director, have feedback um, and not take it personal and just kind of like produce multiple revisions of your work um, because this is the real deal, you know? And you know, you have the experience of billing hours of logging the things that you know you do, the time that you spend. Um, so yeah, but I mean, at the same time, just having fun and, and because you have like different projects that are coming from different companies and different industries, so you, so you get that variety in your life, which is really cool. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, I always kind of tried to implement a little bit of that kind of like whimsical, like illustration and a little bit of like nostalgic appeal that I've always kind of gravitated towards. Um, here's some, some uh, branding that I did for a local 
um, restaurant at the time. I'm not 100% sure if they're still open, but um, yeah, we did some really cool illustrations and some packaging and some gift cards. And I look fondly at that time um, where, you know, you kind of like are still crafting your path. Um, you know, as all things change, I started to get a little bit like thoughtful about how, how much time I wanted to spend in a project because when you're working in an agency and for those who do work in agencies can probably confirm sometimes you have to let go of the work when it's when it's done right you kind of have a timeline you stick to a brief and then you have the revisions that you do and then the the work is done you get paid and and then you kind of move on to the next project and I was just getting this sense of like oh, I really I really wish I could just know more about this client I wish I could maybe do over some stuff that I, once it's live and once it has aged a little bit, I kind of feel like, oh, maybe it's not working that well. Um, so yeah, I kind of was craving a little bit more time with one project to be able to go deeper. Um, and that, and also, you know, I was trying to get the itch of kind of like a big city. So um, I did end up talking to my creative director and I remember it was January of 20, 14 and I told him that I was leaving and he asked me like wh when and I told him December <laughs> and I don't know how common it is to give a year uh, notice uh, I never done it so I don't I don't, I don't know uh, but I did and I told him you know I'm just kind of seeking these opportunities and then when I moved to San Francisco yeah and I wanted to yeah like I said I wanted to commit I wanted to almost kind of make it official by just saying it out loud to someone uh, who would hold me accountable. So um, yeah, and I think that I, at the same time, I was starting to hear the buzz of like in-house design teams and like how companies were able to kind of craft their like little agencies inside themselves. So they, so these teams could actually get the sense of like really how the business works, like really what is the voice of the brand, where is the company moving and just kind of create just like in parallel because from within, right? So I started hearing about teams, Dropbox, uh, teams said like, uh, Facebook, Google, and just kind of hearing the stories of, of how they operate. And I was really, really interested. Um, so yeah, I, during that year, I, in preparation, I started just really kind of focusing on my portfolio, really documenting my work and just started just, you know, interviewing, sending resumes, getting rejected, rejected, a few calls, a few interviews, rejection. It's not, not fun, but every single time uh, I would hang up the phone and I felt like I didn't do well, I was like, okay, just kind of shake up the feeling because you got another call maybe next week. And so at the end of the day, I ended up um, uh, uh, signing an offer for a tiny little bit startup called Hello Sign. They do um, e-signatures and just trying to make the whole process of signing a document not a nightmare like it like it is right now still with wet signatures and it was a team of uh, I think 25 at the time 28 uh, very small and yeah I, I came to join them so I came to San Francisco and I wanted you to picture me kind of like a romantic uh, comedy just kind of like a small town girl in the big city and then just I, I, I used to live by the cable car line so that's what I would wake up every morning it was really really great just fascinating uh the community there are communities really strong in San Francisco in the Bay Area um I was having um, a lot of fun going to events and visiting like studios and just just everything just spoke to me um it was and just beautiful just scenery really amazing um there was this one thing though i didn't feel like i spoke the same language i english is not my first language so i had to learn that and then i still had to learn like slang in english and i still like moved into the bay and i felt like everything that i was hearing was just kind of like this like these words like optimize and mindshare and like evangelize and unicorns and um yeah that was extremely confusing um i think that 
when I was, when I joined the company and I had my first few meetings, I remember feeling very, very frustrated because I couldn't understand absolutely anything. Um, you know, as a, I guess as an immigrant who's coming into this country and like realize and kind of like that extreme work ethic that you kind of like subject yourself because you kind of have to make your parents proud because they, they, they're, you know, they're putting you through college or they're like doing their best to kind of push you forward in life. And, and then you feel like you've done everything and extra. And then um, you coming, you're coming in and you already kind of feel like you don't belong. I mean, I was, I think one of two Latinos in the entire company um you know woman designer there's a whole lot of layers of imposter syndrome and like not belonging and kind of like you being the first that a lot of things so not understanding people or like feeling like I, there's still another layer of like language that i don't belong did really kind of like did make me feel like i wasn't part 100 percent. later i would come to understand like that you know, words are, do not define you. <laughs> and I think that with like the whole like tech jargon, um, there's a lot of like overuse in, you know, in the, in the industry. And I kind of made it, once I realized, I was like, no, there's perfectly good uh, words that are simpler to say and that everyone understands. I kind of made it a little bit of like my mission to just make things clearer. Um, and for that, I would just kind of like say, speak simply. Like I try to not use such much jargon. I would love to have a poll um, for the people who are listening. Um, or maybe actually just in the chat, if you guys can like, or everyone who's listening, y'all can like type down your buzzword that is like, just kind of gets to you. It's confusing or it's like the worst that you hate. I would love, um, or maybe like one that you love. I don't know, anything in the chat, I would love to, to see what you guys or what you're all thinking because um oh oper operationalize yeah like you know a lot of these words um come from complex technical processes however not not all meetings actually have very complex complex processes right like ideate i'm pretty sure is think and touch base, I'm pretty sure it's just like check, you know? I'm sure circle back is also like respond. And I'm sure that mission critical is just important. I still am kind of like unicorns are still kind of a question mark to me. Streamline is just like, I don't know, like make better or like make simpler. Um, so let's see, uh, KPIs, high level overview, synergies, flesh out, yeah so so just a lot of acronyms a lot of like learning um a lot of getting used to and a lot of honestly like when you talk to other people who are not in the industry one is able to find words to replace these so why why not use them when you're actually talking to people why not actually talk like that i think um that's one of like my insights that i have taken with me was just like speak simple simply it's actually very inclusive because for people who are like me, not like if English is not the first language or coming from like another industry, we might be a little too shy to ask what that means. And that actually it's getting in the way of, for, of doing our job and we're actually pretty good at our jobs. So don't make, I mean, for teams that are making, trying to make products very simple, I feel like sometimes we get caught up in like extremely complicated uh, speak. So, um, yeah, so uh, when I joined HelloSign, um, I was still a junior designer and my manager at the time, we were a team of two people. She was taking more uh, care of like more of the product stuff. So a good way for me to start uh, pretty much going into um, the brand aspect of the company was through the culture. Um, and I, the people who I worked with were amazing. Uh, I still like I cherish the health and team, great people. And I wanted to, you know, we wanted to create a culture in which we 
could bond over the same like things and just kind of give ourselves a pat on the back for a job well done to speak kind of like our values. So I started doing a lot of like fun things for the company, like t-shirts for pride, for events, like summer parties, um, have some happy hours after work and we would put together these really cool um, gifts and like swag. Um, we did like uh, some shirts for our a remote team at the time who was we're not remote team everyone's a remote team but at the time it was only a small portion of our team but we sent we, we kind of brand them as like the orbiting crew because they were always kind of like around but watching over us and 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 um we made them like a like some gifts and some t-shirts um so that was kind of like what i focused on the first um year of my career there and then um one day my manager, um, she pulled me aside and then she told me that she was leaving. And that was, that was really crazy. Um, I had been pretty much there for a little bit, a, a year and a half probably. And I was still just kind of getting used to living in a new place, away from my family, a new industry, new jargon, new processes, new way of do doing things. And there was an entire side of the product that I really, that was not my, really my discipline. So I was, I was really, really, um, really scared. You know, I, I'm not gonna lie. I thought of quitting. I was like, because that means that I'm the only designer. And it means that I am the person who's um, in charge of pretty much the rest of the design tasks and projects and decisions. And that just seems um, like just like too much, right? I still depending depended a lot on her direction for for me kind of like making calls and decisions. However, I had a really good team that, like I said, um, they provided a lot of support. Um, they set like realistic expectations. Said we don't expect you to know every single answer. We are here because we um, we're gonna help you and we're gonna do this together and we're gonna help you f like, grow a team. Uh, but for now. Uh, we know that you uh, you're a designer through and through, and we are gonna get to get through this together if you decide to stay. So I decided to stay, and I that's like my second probably insight of knowing when to take a challenge. Um, taking challenges and getting uncomfortable is important for growth, right? And um, you know, the know when you're compromising one thing for the other. Um, in my case, if I hadn't known. If I hadn't had a team that really offered that support, it would probably would have been an extremely stressful situation. Um, so you know, have a have a good having a good team, it's 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 worth a lot, you know. So I took the challenge and I stayed. And as we were um, doing a little bit of like the uh, kind of like connecting my 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 manager and I about like the things I had to get done as she was getting ready to leave I asked her to give me kind of like some like advice or like some kind of like parting words and she said um, have an opinion right always have an opinion um, and that would come in I mean I've always thought about that and that was years ago and that would come in um, as to play a part later on because um, as a team of one, it's it's important that at least you have you're representing your own team and you're representing yourself. So you gotta you gotta craft that. Um, I think that growth is. I mean, obviously, it's not linear. You kind of bounce through like highs and lows, and you change and you you pivot. Here's another buzzword. But I think the starting point of change is having like an opinion or a point of view, and it doesn't mean that you have to like keep it for life. You can you have to have the humbleness to like change in the humility to to know when you're wrong or when you can improve but you have to stand for something right because if you don't if you don't stand for something that means you're not really thinking about it um and you know uh, i kind of held that very close and started like working and i did a little bit of product design but i still mostly just kind of started going into web which at the time it was still not my um expertise to be honest i was still quite removed from ux um, but, you know, I started kind of, you know, doing projects on the website and redesigning a few things and then the blog and then it was like entire other programs that had to do with the brand and like content creation and, you know, um, uh, capturing, you know, 
you know, users and leads so we can just kind of like inform them about like hello sign and how great of a product it is. Um, I'm not going to lie. It wasn't, it wasn't easy in the sense that I still went in there in meetings and when I was asked why to a lot of decisions, I was still like, I don't know quite why. And sometimes it was frustrating not knowing how to defend my decisions. Um, I was still kind of working on a, on a design language for terminology that was important to, to my discipline. But again, like having under, like when feedback comes from the right, from the right place, you don't take it personally. You kind of like, okay, um, next time I'll be better or next time I'll be more prepared or yeah, actually, why don't I know why I made this? Maybe I actually should kind of think a little bit more about it and seek resources and think about that. So as the time has passed and I am like now part of like the Dropbox team, uh, still in hello sign. I, a lot of people have asked me how, why have I stayed for so long and I've, and I've been at hello sign almost for six years now, which is like a ton of time in startup years. But, um, you know, there's always something to learn and I have found a way to learn something. Um, at the end of the day, um, when, I have a year and I still feel very proud about, I start another year thinking, if I were the manager of the person who I was last year, what would I tell her to, to do? Like, what does she need to grow on, right? What resources can I get her to get better to the, to the point that she can have more impact, she can have more influence on the design decisions, so she can like experiment. Um, and I do it like I, I act as my own manager and now I have a, an amazing manager and the team is is much bigger, but I still kind of like I take care of myself as a manager does and um, and I pretty much reinvent my job every year. So like maybe this year I'm going to be focusing more on like content. And maybe I'm not like a copywriter, but I'm going to read about best practices on writing because I see it for too long that maybe this isn't right or or I've been asked too many things. Uh, times about this and I don't have a good answer and I know it's not my main discipline but I feel like it's important so I'm going to know it so I treat every year as like a fresh like I just started at hello sign and and, and and there's always things to learn like it, it has never gotten boring so now um yeah my uh, job at Dropbox and Hello Sign. It's like a different capacities. I still get to do like a lot of illustration uh, for for the community and for things like Pride and for things like uh, like stickers and you know internal events. And I still and now I do product illustration. I I get to work with the researchers and I get to work with writers and product designers and I understand um, more of that discipline. And I still work with the planning and strategy and um, analytics on our website. And I've done uh, several redesigns and, and migrations to like new tools. And and I've ha I have a say in like where things go and I have documented like systems and, and I still get to illustrate, you know, for editorial, um, pieces on our blog, which I love. Uh, but something that I love, uh, I think this year is being involved in like diversity and 3D, which is diverse Dropbox design is an opportunity um, to get involved at Dropbox um, and to, you know, create resources and opportunities for black and brown designers to get into the industry and if they're in the, in the industry to have a voice and visibility and, and kind of share the same experience of like, being maybe the only one and maybe feeling like you don't belong or feeling like you have to work extra to actually get to the same level as everyone else. So I have uh, what's called 3D breakfast, which I are uh, every quarter, or every month, depending on kind of how, how much work we have. But uh, we invite designers, black and brown designers to kind of just meet over lunch. We used to do it on the office, but now we do it here um, remote. Everyone's in the living room and we talk about anything design we have geeked out of like over design systems we have talked about like this year has been very difficult for everyone you know and we talk about that and we talk about the power of design we talk about difficult managers we talk about difficult experiences feedback um the roller coaster of emotions that it is you know loving design and and sometimes feeling like like it doesn't love you back right so yeah, this is also a shout out that if you are interested in, in you know, 
opportunities if you're a, a black and brown designer to reach out. We have a lot of programming during the year uh, 3D has. And you know, to close off, because I know I would love for for some questions from the from the audience. Um, these are kind of like my takeaways from this journey. Uh, that is, I mean, again, these are my opinions right now, and they might change. But I, this is kind of like up to now what I really stand for. Speak simply, and with speak simply, I also mean speak authentically. Like say what you mean, right? Um, and know when to take a challenge uh, because it is important to get uncomfortable you know uh, i moved away and I, I miss my parents so much and my friends and my the rest of my family but it's important to to, to you know to get a little uncomfortable and for growth uh, but it's not it, it you shouldn't compromise your mental health like that's not healthy um, you know know your worth um, have an opinion, yeah, like for now start somewhere uh, and then make a point to refine those, change them and share it, you know, and you know, reinvent your job. Uh, at this time, it's for some, it might feel like uh, not a great time to leave your job if you don't feel like 100% motivated by it. But if you find it useful to change perspectives and, and think of it like, okay, I'm going to start from scratch what do I have influence in, right? What, where can I make actual change? Um, it helps. It helps find things that you never thought you were interested in. And suddenly you're like, wow, I, I, I'm in love with this. Um, and that's pretty much it. I thank you guys so much for, for giving me the opportunity to be in your living rooms, um, you know, kitchens, wherever you guys are listening to me. Um, and I hope you found this useful. And I would love to hear any questions, comments, um about really anything you can think of um yeah thank you thank you so much Benenice, for sharing your experience um and your artwork it's beautiful um there are some questions that came in so we can start with those um if uh, for everyone else like if you do have any other questions that you'd like to ask but say today feel free to use the q a feature and we'll try to get through as many as we can um, so with that, the first question here is, what do you do to put your, push yourself out of your comfort zone when you feel stuck in a rut? And how do you figure out when you should be pushing yourself more? I talk about it. I think I'm the kind of person that has, and my team can attest to that. My feelings are very close to the surface. So when I'm, um, when I'm happy, like I am, like today, for example, you guys can probably tell, like I've fixed my own head. But when I'm not feeling so great, it's very obvious. So I just talk to people about it. Um, I talk to my team and it helps, it helps remind you that we're all going through this together at different, some people might be, you know, riding high on their like, career. Some people were like, maybe like not doing so great and having questions. So talking about it and finding community is really important. Um, I, I go, I have some rituals. I do talk to myself a lot. Um, I think it comes from, I learn by like doing and like saying and, and so I have a lot of like very cathartic conversations with myself and I, I draw a lot. I, I keep a journal, a visual journal. I'm not, I don't necessarily like write my thoughts, but I do draw them. Um, and I really evaluate like, where is it that I wanted to be a year ago? And like, okay, how much? Because it's very easy to feel, to not be gentle with yourself and kind of like um, have expectations that are not realistic, that are imposed by a million other things around you. Um, to just kind of like check back with yourself, um, be grateful for what you have, but don't like, don't don't forget about like when something isn't isn't giving you, you know, the same satisfaction. You either change something within yourself or like change or change the environment. So introduce change when you're feeling like like something's just not giving you the happiness that it used to. But yeah, a lot of conversations with yourself, just being introspective, really. Great. Um, there were a couple of questions that came in around um, Hello Sign and Dropbox and how that transition was. So, um, how was that transition for you? And was it was it a big shift for you when Hello Sign? Um, was required by Dropbox? Yeah, well, actually, I think we had, we were, it was the best scenario <laughs> we could have hoped for. Um, I have always respected the, the, the design team at, at Dropbox. Um, you know, I 
very talented designers, very empathetic people. The whole, everyone who we've met has been just great to work with. So, and you know, there was, I think one thing that was emphasized on um, both like, you know, leadership of both companies is like, we share very common values. And that's something that I, I can attest to. Um, if people are really at the center of like the things that we do and, and the, the, tra the transition was not hard in the sense that you would join just like, for example, like a, a family of like hundreds, thousands really. And then you get to actually like ask people about like their work and they're happy to tell you about it. And, and it's just been um, an amazing journey of like sharing so much knowledge and things that, for example, as a larger company, they've gone through that hell center. It's like, oh, great. Now, now we know, right? Or in the same of brand as a designer, it's like what things worked out when you had to kind of like replicate them, like scale them, right? Oh, okay. Here's some learnings. Uh, but you know, you're always kind of happy to, to craft your own path, but it's honestly, it's just been great. Awesome. Um, do you have any advice for new grads that are pursuing a field in design during this time? Yeah, talk, I talk to people, like seek resources. Um, it's scary at any stage. I think even like doing this and talking to Sarah and I were talking earlier, it's feel a little bit uncomfortable. I don't like, but you know, it's, I'm thinking again, like if I were the manager or like like me like a year ago i would have loved to attend these and especially because now people from all over the world get to participate i mean people who are from in berlin i'm like hi you know in italy like how are you you know um seek out resources most people think that as a maybe like a little more senior designer i still thought maybe a month ago it was like oh no i'm not really like senior enough to be mentoring anyone like I, what do i really know i just know but then as you kind of like really look back you're like there are learnings and you can you know provide someone to so always be teaching someone something share like share and always seek to learn someone from someone else um and not just don't stick necessarily to one discipline i mean i would have loved to have more experience in ux um and just web overall but my education was very traditional graphic design um crafted towards working at an agency um so i would have loved to have those resources and now that we do um i just tell students like talk to people like sign up for things um kind of like just do do you do your thing and and don't be shy to talking about people people love i love meeting new people so talk to me message me i'll 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 talk to anyone really awesome thanks for volunteering that um when you have specific style directions that you're going for how do you how do you voice that to stakeholders and how do you support those kind of um, pushes for those directions yeah so that's a great question um I think that, for example, illustration, it's a big trend right now. And there's a reason why that is. Um, people respond to people, right? We are, um, we're conditioned to respond to the struggles and the successes and the cues of other people as well. We, we, that's how we connect with others, right? And I think companies that were building product, products that were helping in the end to improve that, improve just like a, something in their works and it would end up having results and people having more time, for example, to do whatever they wanted to do outside of work. Um, that narrative was very prevalent in like, for example, like um, there's tech products, right? Like products like um, like the ones uh, Dropbox, HelloSign. And at the end of the day, if that's like the value of the company, um, it, like a, a style that reflects the ultimate goals it's it's a good match but there's a lot of happen in between for that to get like approved and have like say illustration or not illustration or photography or whatever else and i think that um you really kind of have to have agreement on what are the things that as a company like are the voice of the brand uh what things are not non-negotiable that if someone were let's say throw a ton of money at you 
for you to for a company to stop saying that they support xyz issue that they care about like no that's absolutely not negotiable or, or if like we work to compromise sales for maybe having a terrible culture and like people not feeling great or like doing a, a product that has terrible um you know that impacts negatively on something like what what values really in the company are not negotiable and then you really kind of type yourself to those and you build um something that people respond really well to and it's really agreement and that for agreement it, you have to talk the design team talks to really everyone i mean we talk to researchers we talk to like um customer support we talk to um to product to to everyone who has uh to everyone really um and it honestly when it feels right it feels right and you go yeah you still go through a lot of iterations and you because you you're part of like something you know bigger there's releases and there's like you know there's implementation times but um it's always honestly sometimes it's changing too but there are things that are not negotiable and that's the things that you as a designer as a brand designer you you stick to um, again, like an opinion, like um, that you're open to change, but there are things that are non-negotiable. And that's kind of how you, how you get to the better conversations about what style, what, what is, what are we doing and what are we not doing, but to find those really. Yeah, that's a really great approach. It sounds like sticking to your opinions is kind of a, kind of a theme here today. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe I have time for like one more question. Um, I think in your presentation, you kind of touched on this when you talked about, you know, uh, having to let go of work when you work at an agency because, you know, you have to deliver it to your clients. Um, but how do you how do you think about and weigh working for a brand versus working for a design studio or a creative agency? Um, I think something that and that's just, again, like a personal experience. The time that you spend, you can you can make you can work on something forever, right? <laughs> but not really. You can probably work something forever in your personal time. I don't get to work forever on things, even like as an in-house designer. Um, I do think that even if you work in an agency, you can bring those points to the to the conversation to your team. Um, and at the end of the day, both teams, in-house and agencies, want to provide value, right? to their clients um, um, as a design team. Like my, my clients can be like my own um, teammates if I do something internal or like really our, our users if we're doing something outside. So ultimately when you provide, when you know that you're providing value, um, you find ways to say, for example, if you're an agency and you don't think that there's enough research being done in something and it's kind of like cranked out faster than you can have a conversation and you, bring maybe the best practices. Uh, that's another probably tip is like come pro flagging problems is, is good, but it's very useful to come with solutions. Um, sometimes it's, it's it will take doing a little bit of like homework in that sense, but it, it's not like throwaway work because you have even if it doesn't get implemented, you keep it, you have it um, and then you start doing it in your own work and it reflects um, Then suddenly people are saying, hey, you know, like this actually work. Um, it's actually more successful or it's actually resonating more for and I and then you can say you can talk about what you're actually doing and it then motivates uh, people um, to actually implement it into their way that they work as well so I mean even if no one is too junior to have something to share and to provide to whatever team they're working on awesome thank you um, I think that's um all the questions that we had and we're just about at time so that's perfect um but you say thank you again so much for sharing your experience um your story is just so inspiring and i think it really resonated just looking at the zoom chat um with people that were here today um so thank you again so much and uh for everyone that joined us thank you for taking the time to join us um and listen to Veronica's story and yeah, we hope to see you at the next event and have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you, everyone. I hope your, your day, your Thursday is amazing. And um, yeah, reach out. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.